blood and the blessed hope. Plead the blood from beginning to the end. Claim the blood, the only covering for your sin. The blessed hope, our Lord is coming back again. We need the blood, the blood and the blessed hope. stop Satan from attacking what God said. Your self-improvement will not keep him from uncovering your own sins. The reform will only make you doubt. Our Lord will come again. He takes the book, the blood and the blessed hope. Believe the book from beginning to the end. Claim the blood, the only covering for your sin. The blessed hope. Our Lord is coming back again. We need the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. Believe the book from beginning to the end. Claim the blood, the only covering for your sin. The blessed hope is coming back again. We need the book, the blood, the blessed hope. Thank you, ladies. We're going to do something different. I know we're in another series right now for Sunday school, but you're going to get a change up for this morning. Uh, when we came back uh, on, I came back on Thursday uh, night, uh, well, Thursday afternoon I got here, and when we got to church Thursday night, we had the storms kicking up and hit, running through, and, um, and it ended up, our power ended up getting shut off during the whole service, so... We were, it's like having Christmas Eve candlelight service. We, that's what we did. Um, and uh, it was kind of fun. Enjoyed that um, a little bit. But, um, you know, we didn't have everybody around. So I thought, you know, one, I didn't get to, we didn't get to record it and put it on YouTube. And then second, uh, it was a good message, and I thought it would be good for all of us to hear it. So be in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number five. Can you turn me down just a tad bit, Richard? I'm, I'm kind of... Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, and then we're just going to look at two verses, verses 8 and 9. So for those who did stick around during the candlelight service, you're going to get it again. So it says, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and the violent perverting of judgment and justice in the in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your goodness to us. And we do pray you'll speak to our hearts this morning and help my, my own mind to be clear as I teach through your passage, this passage here. And use it to um, just really give us confidence and hope uh, in the fact that you are the God who's in control even when things seem to be going out of control. And uh, we just love you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it'd be clear to understand, especially within the last uh, couple years, to understand just how broken our world is. I think uh, just watching what has happened, it's just been some of the bit of the conversation with our guest here this, this uh, weekend of the COVID and the things that were done during COVID and the kind of what felt like abuse that was being given toward uh, the way they handled the COVID and uh, living in what feels like oppression where you have uh, people uh, taking away freedoms. And I'm glad I live in a free country. I'm glad I don't live in North Korea. I'm glad I don't live in China. I'm glad I don't live in in Venezuela and other places in the world that are very restrictive on freedom. And uh, I'm glad I don't live in Canada right now for some of the ways that they've treated um, the whole COVID stuff and Australia as much as 
I would be eager to see those places. Um, uh, I, I hate the fact to watch oppression happen and this abuse that goes on. Solomon here is talking about oppression. This is not the first time he's talked about it here in Ecclesiastes. If you were to go back over to chapter 4, you see it in verse 1 where he says it again, or he says it before. He says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such as were oppressed, that they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressor there was power, but they had no comforter. Twice, he says, they had no comforter. And the idea of comforter means they had no one to help them. They had no savior. They had no Moses-like savior that would deliver them from the burden of the nation or people they were under. They, they didn't have a deliverer. They didn't have a judge that delivered them out of the hand of some foreign enemy. Um, and it appears, by the way he describes there in chapter 4, verse 1, is they lived completely bound to the whims and wishes of the dictator, of the, of the one who rules over. He, it says he had power in his stead. And, it, and then Solomon goes on to describe them shedding tears and, and wishing that they would die or even coming to the place where they would, where they would uh, feel uh, or even come to those statements where they'd say, it's just better I'd never been born than to experience this, to live in those days. And that's not unique to people who are going through oppression. There's several times in the Bible you see that happening. You see that happening with Job after going through his trials where he said he wished right after it's Job chapter I believe it's three where he's, he, he cursed the day of his birth wishing he had not been alive to see these days wishing he had just been born stillborn uh, you see that with Elijah saying something along those lines after after uh, the great day of victory and then right after that watching Jezebel and um, you know making the threat and then he feels like he's worse than ever and he's not as good as his father's and wishes that he would die same kind of feelings and and i don't think that solomon is giving bad advice and saying that that's the way it is he's just describing the feelings of what it feels like to be oppressed he goes on and he says that here in this description but it's got a different angle to the oppression in chapter five and the the topic here he's dealing with now focuses on somebody who is uh has a specific, he calls it a specific uh, oppression here, he calls it an, an, an oppression of the poor, an oppression of the poor. And the implication, sort of like you saw back in chapter number four, is that those who are suffering under these tyrants are the ones who have no power or no money, specifically, to defend themselves. No money to defend themselves. And for the most part, I would say that's everybody when times of oppression happen. Most people can't hire a lawyer. Most people can't get enough or have enough power or influence to sway uh, a dictator or a leader to go a different way. And Solomon gives an even more bit of a description of this oppression. Look what he called it in verse 1. He called it the violent perverting of judgment and justice. Um, now, think about the, there's two words there. You got judgment and justice. Judgment is, is a reference to the place where justice would be found. Judgment would be specifically what we would look at in our modern times, a courthouse, where you have a judge that's going to render a verdict based on uh, uh, something that has been done wrong to somebody. We, we all understand that, especially in our day and time, if you pay attention a bit to any bit of to politics. People are always looking for a court decision to be made to render justice on the behalf of somebody who feels oppressed. And justice, by its very word, means vindication. Vindication. It's what a righteous judge is supposed to do. It's a reward that a righteous judge is supposed to give to one that's being abused, one that's being oppressed, where the judge puts down the oppressor. But in this case, Solomon says that the justice is being perverted. And he doesn't just say it's being perverted. He uses a word that, that, that's described as violent perversion. Violent perversion. It's only one word in the Hebrew. It's the word gazelle, not the animal. But it is, the word simply means robbery or plunder. Robbery or plunder. And so the implication is that justice is being stolen away. What is intended to go to the victim is being twisted and stolen away. 
And again, by implication, it's because of the powerful ones are influencing those that should be stopping this. You know, people who've got money swaying a judge to make a, a decision uh, in another way. And instead of the judge being impartial and concerned with following the law, he's more interested in being swayed by somebody's gift. Do you know God has a pretty high view of judgment and justice in the scripture? It's, it's spoken about lots of times. Uh, when God gave Israel the law, when it, you know, they were being set apart as the, as the nation that they would be, he set up in their law system the judicial system of how it was supposed to work. Uh, Leviticus 19.15, let me read you some of them. I'm going to give you a few here in just a moment. He says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, God says. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. Meaning you need to have a blindfold, and when you're making judgment, you don't honor a poor person just because he's poor, and you don't honor a rich person just because he's rich. You put the blindfold on, he says... In righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So righteousness means do what is right or what fits according to God's law. You judge based on that way. In Deuteronomy, God reminded them that the reason why they are to execute righteous judgment is because that's the way he executes judgment. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, he says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth not execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow. I'm sorry, he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Meaning here, God makes impartial judgments. He's not a respecter of persons, and he doesn't take reward. You know that one of the reasons why God won't, take, won't accept your good works on the day of Day of Judgment is because that's a reward, Appear, appears as a reward to God to try to sway the judgment. God won't be swayed by your good deeds. Um, he doesn't regard you as, as anyone special. And it says in here, and in, in specifically he says there in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 10, is that he does take special interest, though, in those that are being oppressed, the poor and the fatherless meaning widows, uh, he even says the stranger, that would be a foreigner, one that doesn't have any rights in the land, but is concerned about them being abused. God is a God who cares for people being abused. One of the things he says about himself is he calls himself a father to the fatherless. He cares for them. God even pronounces a curse on a judge who refuses to render righteous judgment. Listen to this, Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of stranger, fatherless, and widow. If you do what the culture is saying, they're just in your way, you gotta, they're just bothersome, you don't want to put up with those people, and you just shove them off into the corner and don't really vind or render a righteous uh, uh, vindication or a righteous uh, justice statement for them so that they can be be delivered from their oppressor. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, judge, you will bring a curse on you. And not only that, that, that passage there, Deuteronomy 27, he was speaking to the entire nation. So he was saying, in some sense, it becomes a nationwide curse when judges do this. You let the rich and powerful control you, you'll bring God's curse against you. Proverbs 18 that viewpoint keeps going on. I, I, again, I say it's all the way through the Old Testament. It is into the New Testament as well. Uh, Proverbs 18, 15, it says, It's not good to accept the persons of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. And there you obviously see a bad judge. Not just neglecting someone in need, but exalting one that's wicked and overthrowing one that's righteous by judgments. And again, one more thing I want to note. I'm not going to give all these because I have a lot in here I've mentioned, but I, I know our time's not as long this morning. But one of the things that God says about um, Jesus Christ is that when he comes on the scene, he is going to become a judge as well. And he's going to render judgment that is righteous judgment. Uh, Isaiah 42, speaking of him in verses 1 to 4, it says, Behold my servant... 
It's talking about Jesus, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. We sing that song at Christmas time, or that out of Handel's Messiah, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then it goes on, it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And what that's referring to is this very thing, that he is going to be a righteous judge over all the nations and will deal with evil. And we understand that as being the final judgment uh, officially when he judges. So the point here is we know that God cares about these things. When you see things going on in our government right now, uh, where you have judges rendering horrible verdicts against righteousness, you know God cares about that. That's not just for the nation of Israel. He cares about that all over the world. Uh, when you have judges that say homosexuality is acceptable or that transgenderism is an acceptable thing and everybody that's, that has an, a view that's a biblical view that stands against that is wrong, God says you're bringing a curse upon not only your head but upon the people that you represent by bringing that stuff in. So God cares about those things. Now, look at Solomon's advice. Go back to our text and look what he says. Just a little statement here. He says, marvel not at the matter. So when you see this happening, he says, he says, marvel not at the matter. Now, the word marvel just means to be astounded or stunned or be amazed or be dumbfounded. That's, that's the definition of the Strong's word for this. So Solomon is saying, when, when, you, when you see oppression happening in the land, specifically here, he gives the specifics against the poor. When you see justice and judgment being thrown out the window, don't be astounded, don't be stunned. Now, I want to get into this to, to, to understand the, the intent of what Solomon is saying here. Solomon isn't saying to his readers, just stop being bothered by these things and grow thick skin and just endure it. He's not telling his, his readers here that they just need to be calloused and unconcerned with that. That would not be right. Um, one of the things that you uh, see in the book of Ezekiel, that God, before he was saying before he would come into the land with Nebuchadnezzar and destroy Jerusalem, is that he sent his angel into the land, to, into the city, to go and mark the heads of those that were grieved at the awful things that were happening in the city. And he says, so that when I come and I judge, those people will be spared. Because he cares about how you care about those things. It should bother you if you love the Lord. All that love the Lord should hate evil. He's not telling, Solomon's not telling them, just get thick skin and don't worry about it. Don't marvel, don't let it, don't let it take your breath away. That's not what he's saying. A few weeks ago, I don't have a TV at my house, at least not that you can be connected to anything except a, a DVD player that the kids put kids' movies on. But I do watch news on my, on my phone, little news clips on YouTube, and I, I happen to watch, uh, I watch every once in a while uh, Fox News stuff. I'm just kind of addicted to that, I guess. But um, I was watching a Tucker Carlson show. And he, the, I don't remember the title of the, of the segment. It was just a little 10-minute segment. But he was describing just how bad society is getting and how callous society is getting to the evils that are happening in the land. And it, he showed in the segment there a security camera that apparently there had been a man that had just gotten out of his car, probably going to his house. I don't know exactly what the whole setup was there. But there were, unbeknownst to him, behind him, there was a man walking with a gun right at his head and got right on him and shot him. They blurted at that point, shot him, guy was killed right there on the spot. And the whole time that's going on, he's stripping out whatever he can get out of the guy, off the guy's body. The whole time there's a man 
50 feet away, 70 feet away, sitting on a curb watching it. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't respond in any way. Then after that guy leaves, after shooting the guy leaves, another guy comes on the scene, and, he's, and he comes and continues to plunder. Whatever is left, he can get off of the man. And then the video goes on, it clips a little bit later, and you have that man getting up, and he just walks by, and he just shakes his head, and this walks on. No concern. Not at all. Just calloused almost. And, and in the, in the art, in what Tucker Carlson was saying, he said, who really did wrong in this? He said, every one of them did wrong. Not the guy that just murdered. That's not the only wrong. And not the second guy who plundered the remainders. But the guy sitting on the curb did nothing when he should have done something. Solomon isn't saying in this passage, just don't do nothing. Just, just sit and get used to it. Just don't let it bother you. Just don't, don't, don't do anything about it. That's not what he's saying. As you're going to see later in the verse here, the context of what Solomon is talking about revolves around the subject of God's involvement in the world. And so Solomon's advice isn't harden your heart against the evils of the world, but rather he's saying don't live your life in a state of despair and hopelessness when these things happen. When you see evils going on in the world, don't despair and let it take your heart as though there is no hope. The context of the book of Ecclesiastes, if you remember, what we've been looking at, the context of the book of Ecclesiastes is that you, where you can find joy, where you can find happiness. It's not in the things of this world. Solomon says, I've done that. I went through and I found everything doesn't work. You, everything you can ever want, you can't find happiness in it. It's not in a change of your circumstances. It's not in whether things are just going well for you because those things don't last. And here he's saying, and it's not when, the, when an oppressor comes on the scene and rips it away from you. It can't, your joy should not be so uh, shallow that it can be ripped away when bad things happen. Your joy is to go further than that. Your happiness of heart, your purpose of life is beyond the circumstances that you're living in. If your circumstances change your joy, your happiness, your, your happiness is placed in the wrong thing. Happiness doesn't come when things are only going well because things don't always go well, do they? living in this world. Last two years prove that. And what Solomon is saying here fits then obviously with the overarching context of what he's been saying all the way through. Remember uh, Jesus sent his disciples out uh, and he sent them, he empowered them to go and, and um, cast out devils and heal people and do all those kind of things. When we were in, in Luke chapter 10, I, I remember titling that passage right there, The Little Great Commission, because it was sort of like a pre-run for what the Great Commission would be. And he was sending them to go and preach the kingdom of heaven and do all these kinds of things. And they come back, it says there, it says the 70, they return back again with joy, saying, the Lord, even the, he says to the Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They're so excited. Man, look at all the successes we've got going on. We, we are literally destroying Satan's kingdom by what we're doing. And then Jesus says here to affirm the power they had in verse 18 of Luke 10. He says, Behold, he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's falling at my power is what he's talking about here. But he says here, he says, and behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I am empowering you to do these things. But then he gives this statement to him in verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what he's saying here? Ministry isn't always going to be like that. Ministry isn't always going to be successful and feel like you're just everywhere you go, success, 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 and I'm doing great, and then you're always living on cloud number nine. And if your joy is found in success, then whenever success goes away, your joy is going to go away. But what doesn't change? 
that your condition with God, your relationship with God, that your name is written in heaven. That's what lasts. You remember Elijah? He had a great day of success. Killed all those prophets, you know, fire from heaven, killed all the prophets. Everybody's saying, the Lord is God, this is the one. And then he gets the message from Jezebel. And like all of a sudden, all that success went out the window and he became, he was at the lowest point of depression as far as the scripture records that he ever was. Because your joy doesn't rely on success. It's not supposed to. Problem is we do that, don't we? We try to make our joy based on how good the day's going or how well our ministry's going or how well work is going. And so what Solomon is saying here is that when rough times happen, when evil people do what evil people do, when those in power who have power to stop those evil people don't stop that power, don't stop their power or stop their evil, during those times, don't let your joy get stolen. If the Supreme Court renders some verdict that's horrible and rotten and no good and just, you know it's going to have long-term ramifications. Yes, God says there's, that's wrong and you should be grieved about it, but don't let it steal your joy. Why? Well, Solomon answers that. Look at verse 8. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. You know what he's saying here? There's one that's higher than them. <laughs> He's higher than the highest. This is obviously God, we understand. And living in this broken world, he sees it all. He sees it all. None of it is being missed. None of it is being overlooked. And then he goes on and it says, and he regards it. You know the word regard means? It means he's on watch. He's observing it. He's keeping or retaining it in memory. That's, that's what it means. That's how it's defined in the, in the Strong's. He's keeping it in his memory. God is keeping a record of all the oppressions that happen in the world, all the evils that happen in the world. He sees it all. Nothing escapes his notice. And even though the power of these people may seem to be overwhelming at times, God hasn't turned a blind eye to it. And they are not too big for God to deal with. Do you know what Satan wants you to do in during times of oppression? He wants you to marvel at it. He wants you to come to a place of despair. He wants you to get your eyes off the one who's higher than the highest. He wants you to be overwhelmed with what they're doing and lose your joy, and be really profitless for the kingdom of God. And what Solomon is trying to do in this verse is get your eyes on the right one. If you set your focus on the right one and see it the way it is in truth, you can have joy in the middle of it, because your joy is not based on them doing what they're doing, but based on him who, as Solomon is implying here, will deal with it, will bring all of these things to his throne in judgment. Sometimes we think about how God deals with oppressors. He does great, amazing things. Think about how we see in the book of Exodus. The whole story is a, is a, is a story of God dealing with an oppressor and destroying an oppressor supernaturally. It's amazing watching that. And not only destroying just an, an oppressor as a person, but an oppressor as a nation. The entire nation really crumbles under what God does to them. But then we see God doing the same thing with his own people. Whenever they became the oppressor to the righteous in their land. One of the things you read in, in Jeremiah chapter 1 is that God... God is offering that he would wash their sins white as snow. But he says, but there are things in the land that I cannot tolerate. I don't want your sacrifices. He says, because you don't have judgment and justice for the widowless, for the, for the fatherless, for the widow, for the fatherless, and for the poor. And if you remember, God eventually ends up bringing Nebuchadnezzar against them 
And one of the reasons why he came, there's a lot of them, but one of them specifically that he highlights is what they were doing with this issue of judgment. And I think it's interesting to note, I don't know if I can really make it a full point, but I think it's interesting to note that the people that are left in the land when God is done with it are the poor, as though it becomes their own land to live in. It's almost like God is saying, I'll, I'll render judgment and I will vindicate them for what you've done. We understand that God does that from time to time. But he doesn't always. He doesn't always. I mean, some people, it seems like they just go on and on and on and on, and they live their whole life in pleasure and happiness while they're doing all these things to oppress others. But Solomon is saying here and implying here is that there is coming a great day of reckoning. A great day of reckoning. And that the whole world will be brought to his judgment seat. And all the evils of the world will be dealt with in full. Jesus said it's going to be so, so thorough that he says even the thoughts of your heart will be dealt with in that day. Every idle word will be taken in account thereof in the day, in that day of judgment. In fact, just to see this as the context that what Solomon is saying, go to the very last few verses of the book. Jump over to chapter 12, verse 13. For those that have been in our series, you know I've referenced this quite often because this is really his conclusion, and it helps you know what he's saying altogether, what he's trying to, to render out of the entire, what I would call the Sermon of Solomon here. Verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now look at verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is going to deal with it all. You can't necessarily stop it, and you surely shouldn't live in a place where you become oppressed with it. It's just going to do you no good. James, in James chapter 5, talks about the wicked rich, the, the rich that... Uh, we're oppressing the people of God. And I want you to listen to it. If you want to look at it, it'll be good for you to look. But if not, just listen. And listen to the way he describes the day of judgment coming upon the rich. He says this in verse uh, 5, verses 1 to 6. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. He says, Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. <laughs> just start crying now because it's about to come. He says, your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. He, he says, literally, the very stuff you've been storing up for yourself will be a consuming, it will consume you in the day of judgment. In, in a very literal way, that's the way he's describing it. He says, you have heaped treasure together for the last days. He's talking about judgment. Behold, the hire of the laborer who, you, who have reaped down your fields, which you have kept back by fraud. He says, listen to what it's going to do. The hire, the money. He says, it's going to cry. And the cries of them that have reaped are entered into the, Lord's, uh, into the ears of the Lord of Saboeth. That word Saboeth means host, Lord of hosts. We see that used a lot. And when you see Lord of hosts, that's a way of God talking about himself being the Lord of the armies. The Lord, the general who will bring judgment by his wrath through his armies. He says, You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you, meaning the just. And so the point he's saying here, don't let the evils of men strip you of joy that you should have as a believer, as one who has his trust in God. Our joy doesn't come from this world and it definitely doesn't come from people, because people fail you all the time. And especially when you see these things kind of happen, it reminds you that joy is not based in them. So that's the first side that Solomon says here. You want to not let despair take your heart and evil take your heart. And when evil happens in this world, it take your heart. He says, remember, they're not getting away with it. <laughs> That's, that's a first lesson to remember. They're not getting away with it. 
The second thing he, he mentions here, and it almost seems to be unrelated, but I believe it's still in the context of what he's talking about. Look at verse number 9. He says, Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. And here, it appears what Solomon is talking about is here is that men in their evil hearts aren't allowed to express it to the full. And I, I believe that's the context of what he's saying here. So let's, let's kind of break that apart in just a minute. Um, man, we think of man, man has this high view of himself. From the very first temptation of man, we were talking about this last night, uh, me and uh, Brother Babashek here. If you didn't meet, these are the Babasheks, um, Brother Don and Cynthia. I'm terrible, I'm sorry. I, I get it. It's on record now that I don't know it. <laughs> But in the very first temptation of man, you remember Satan is tempting Eve or the woman as she's called at that point, but he's tempting her with eating the forbidden tree. But there's a motive behind the temptation. And the motive is basically you can be your own God. You will have your eyes open, you will know good and evil, and you basically will be able to decide what's good and evil. And you can throw off the restraints that God is putting on you. You just eat that fruit and defiance against him. Just to show you, you're not going to kill me. That's really kind of the temptation. Satan was able, in those short verses we have there in Genesis chapter 3, to get Eve to, to look at the tree differently, to look at God differently, to look at herself differently. And because she believed those things about, her, about, the, about what Satan was saying, she was willing to disobey, but it didn't work out the way she wanted, did it? But you know, ever since that time, man has continually believed that same lie. That God is a tyrant, keeping me locked, trying to lock me in his prison. If I follow him, he's going to make my life miserable. And that I really should be able to decide right from wrong, good from evil, and I should be that God for myself. They may not, man may not say I'm a God, but that's the way man acts. In fact, that's the way Romans chapter 3, when Paul is describing all of humanity, he describes him in that, that kind of veil. Listen to what he says in Romans 3. He says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. Look to the next one. There's none that seek after God. You know why they don't seek after God? The same reason why a criminal doesn't seek after a police officer. Don't want anything to do with them, to tell me what to do or to bring punishment against me. They're all gone out of the way. They are together, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, no, not one. And then verse 18, he says, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. You know why they have no fear of God before their eyes? Because they have lowered the view of God in their mind. They see him as something other than what he really is. As it's, it's the same thing that Eve was being fed in the day in the garden in that first temptation. And so mankind by nature lives in this constant state of rebellion against his creator. And mankind honestly thinks he doesn't need God. But here's the amazing thing. Even though God lets man stray and go his own way, God never lets man live out his rebellion to the fullest. Mankind might think himself to be free as he lives out his rebellion, but as Solomon is saying here, he's not that free. He's not that free. Um, does anybody remember the story of Jonah? Jonah, I want you to go to the Ninevites and preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah decides, I'm going to flee from the presence of the Lord. That's a stupid statement already, right? And he runs away as far as he can, gets down into a, a boat, and plans to go to the farthest city in the land, you know, in the area that would have been known at the time. They believe that Tarshish was the farthest point away. Does he find out that he can escape God doing that? No, actually finds out the opposite, that you can escape God. And while he's out there in the boat, a storm comes upon him, upon the ship, and, and the mariners are starting to go, this is not normal for this to happen, and they start doing their, 
their superstitious thing where they're casting lots to figure out who it is that caused this, and the lot falls on Jonah. And it must have not just fallen once. It probably fell over and over and over. It's got to be Jonah. And then they say, Jonah, what is it that you've done? And he says, I am a prophet of the Lord who made heaven and earth and the sea. (laughs) Oh, so you can't flee the presence of the Lord. He made it all. And then he thinks, well, yeah, I still can flee. Um, just throw me in the water so I still don't have to do this. That, that'll get me away from God. You know what happens? God prepared a fish, a great fish, to swallow Jonah because you can't escape the presence of the Lord. No matter how much you want to do, you're not going to get away from him. You can't go anywhere in the entire universe and escape him. He's everywhere. How foolish. But man thinks that they can't. Man is not free as he thinks he is. And that's what Solomon is saying in the passage. There are always going to be people who seek to oppress others, who use their money, who use their power to take advantage of others, even using their position of power, like a judge, to pervert or to per- pervert and, and, and twist a, a verdict that is rendered. But Solomon makes the point that even the king... The highest of people has his limits. Look what he says. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. Prophet of the earth. Got two farmers here in the room that know what that, what that probably means. It's, it's, you, put a, you put seeds in the ground, and then after so much time, you get the prophet of the earth that comes out of it. Plant, plants that have fruit and, and things like that. I, I mean, we take advantage of that all the time. We, uh, every, almost everything you eat came out of the ground. Do you realize that? And if it, you say, well, I eat meat only. Do you know if you didn't, have, you didn't have profit of the ground, you wouldn't have meat only? They rely on it, so you still basically rely on the ground. Unless you're good eating plastic. I don't know how long that'll last for you. You may not do too well eating that very long. They got wheat, beans, corn, potatoes, lettuce. Think about all the fruits that we get from trees and bushes. All comes out of the ground. Nuts. How many people like nuts? Yeah. Some of you nuts in here love nuts. And even, as I said, even the flesh of the animals that we may be able to consume, we have that flesh because they rely on the ground, the fruits that come out of the ground, the profit of the ground. So Solomon's point is that mankind, in all his rebellion against God, thinking he is something that can, that can escape God, God is basically saying, you can't. You can't run from me completely because I have set within this creation limitations that you cannot cross. And it even surrounds the highest of people, the king. Those people in high positions of authority, sometimes if you have a wrong view of them, you begin to think they have all power and they can do whatever they want. Look at those people that maybe are making laws that affect us, or, in the, or as in the context, making judgments that are wrong, that affect us. Or you've got people like maybe a president in the, in the country that is, that is enforcing things that are wrong. You know, when all of the whole COVID vaccine stuff was being pushed, I absolutely opposed it. The entire time. And I'm so thankful there were judges that rendered righteous judgment in that. But what would have happened if what would have happened if the judges went the other way? I don't know, and I don't want to venture to think about what would have happened. But you know what? There's someone higher than all of that that would have dealt with it. Or would deal with it in the end. And even though they may appear to have limitless power at times, it's not as li- as limitless as it seems. There's one who, who has a fence around them that makes them really get this, rely on him. 
I think that's amazing, isn't it? So people can't just do whatever they want. And the reason why here he's saying we should not let the evil people and the evil that people do steal our joy is one, because we know God ultimately sees it all and will deal with it all. But two, God has also set limits to their evil. They are not limitless in their evil. And whatever is happening, God is allowing it for his purpose in time. And you need to trust the sovereign hand of God in the middle of that, that he has a purpose for it. I don't always understand everything. One of the things we learn in the book of Ecclesiastes, back at chapter 3, he says here, in back at chapter 3, um, let me find it here. I don't have this in the notes, so I'm just looking at it real quick. He says um, about God setting in the world, the world in the hearts of men, so they cannot dis, uh, uh, that they cannot see the beginning from the end. And uh, someone might find it for me here. But you know what he's basically saying here? I don't tell everybody what I'm doing. And I don't have to explain to people who ask me for an answer for why this is happening. God doesn't always do that. In fact, I don't know him doing it very often where he tells you why he's doing it. You look at the book of Job. Did you see God ever tell Job what he was doing and why he was doing that to Job? Do you know who initiated it? It wasn't Satan that initiated that whole trouble that came on Job's life. It was God who initiated it. It was God who went to, to Satan, or Satan came to, to God, and God said, Hey, have you considered my servant uh, Job, that there's none like him in the earth? That question right there was a way of saying, What do you think? Think you can do anything to him? He says, oh, oh, he serves you only because you're so good to him. But if you take down that, that protection you put around him, um, uh, he won't serve you like that anymore. And you remember, God initiates the trial that begins to take place. He loses everything that he really is dear to his heart almost in one day. Loses his wealth. He loses his children. And in some sense, he has a wife that's absolutely angry at him and God. So he loses that as well. And then we see a little bit later, he loses his health. From the top of his head to the bottom of his foot, he's covered in boils. Anyone ever had a boil? Fun, isn't it? <laughs> and then he loses his friends as the story goes on. Very friends that came to comfort him aren't really good comforters, are they? And he's treated as an outcast and treated as somebody who, who is the worst of people. When the Bible says he, there was none like him in the earth, one that walked with God or feared God and eschewed evil. No one like him. And yet he went from being this high position down to this low position. And never do you see God explaining why he's doing this to Job. Now we get the, the opportunity to see it because we read the background story to it. But God doesn't say, Job, let me just tell you why I'm doing this. I'm trying to make a point to Satan that uh, you're not like Satan said you are. That would probably have been encouraging to Job to endure, but he doesn't do it, does he? God doesn't have to explain why things are going the way they're going. He doesn't promise that he's going to. But as I said, not only is he beholding it all or regarding it all, he also is limiting it. Another thing we learn about Job's story is that Satan doesn't just get to do whatever he wants. Uh, I remember reading somebody who said Satan is like a, a dog, a bulldog on a chain that God holds. And when God wants the bulldog to go in a little bit further, he lets a little more of the chain out. But as soon as he wants him gone, he pulls him back. Satan's not a free-roaming agent to do what he wants. Neither are his agents in the world free-roaming agents to do as they want. God sets boundaries. God sets boundaries. So what should we do? What should we do? Find our happiness in the things of this world. That's what we should do, right? How's that work? When the things of this world get stripped away from you, your happiness is going to also go. Find your happiness in people. 
Find your happiness in people in the church because they'll never fail you. Does that work, Brother Babichette? <laughs> I've been a pastor long enough to know that people in church don't always make you happy. Set your hope and your trust in the highest one, the one that's higher than the highest. And remember that he is, he has absolute authority over all that's going on. And even though they have, those people appear to be doing what they're wanting to do, he has set boundaries and they're not going to go beyond what he has allowed them to do. And so don't live like with this dread of heart. Well, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Only if God says, and if God says he's still working out these things for your good. And you can trust him in it. Amen. Evil might appear to reign, but it's not ultimately reigning. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time here studying your word. I pray that you'll help us to have a right perspective when it comes to evil going on in the world. And that we'll find our joy not in the circumstances of life or in possessions or people that our hope stays in you, that we set our affections on you, the God who reigns and rules over all and sets limits to even the evil that goes on in the world. We love you. We thank you for being that God. And we ask that you help us to have a trust in you when things don't seem to be going right, to trust that you are accomplishing your purposes in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, done a little early. We're going to come back.